to the perfect group for you. Again, this will be happening on August the 27th after both the 9 and 11 a.m. service in our Messiah's House gym. So I want to encourage you to come grab a donut, meet our group leaders, and I assure you that there is a group for everyone. So again, I invite you, be there August 27th after both services, Group Connect in the gym. It's going to be a great time, and we really hope to see you there. I'm Karis and I'm the director of Messiah's House Women and I'm here to tell you about this incredible event we have coming up next month called The Table. The Table is an opportunity for you to sit across the table from another woman and share your heart, share what God's doing in your life, tell them what God's doing in you and share all of those things surrounding the scripture of Isaiah 61. That is a passage that we've been centering on this entire year, and we want you to be a part of that. As our church grows, we find that it's harder and harder to find these intimate one-on-one small group settings, and we wanna give you the chance to be treasured, to be known, to be loved in this safe space and really share your heart. Registration is required. Registration is open. Go to mh.church forward slash women to register. There'll be a small $5 fee and no child care is provided, but ladies, trust me, this one is gonna be worth finding yourself a babysitter. This event is coming up on September 12th and the deadline to register is August 28th. Once you register, you'll be assigned to the home of a Messiah's House woman. This woman is so excited to open her home to you. Now, I know some of you were thinking of this and thinking, this is not my kind of thing. Why would I wanna register for something where I'm gonna go into someone's home where I don't know the people and I don't know whose home I'm gonna be in? And I'm just here to tell you, I was blown away by the testimonies of what people found, what people saw, what people felt and experienced back in our um, table in March. I'm telling you women, you are made for connection. You are made for community. This is exactly what you need. I know many of you desire to find connection with the Lord, to find connection with other women, and this is your chance. So you do not want to miss out on this opportunity. So register right now, find a friend. We want the entire community to be excited about coming to these table events, and we can't wait to see you there.
Good morning, church. Who's excited to worship the Lord this morning? Come on, let's just pour out our praise to Him. Here we go. We invite you here, Holy Spirit. Let's sing this together. I give you glory. Give you glory for all you.
this morning, I want to invite you to lift up your hands as a sign of worship, a sign of surrender. We just release our faith together this morning. We know that sorrow may last for the night, but the joy comes in the morning. Breakthrough comes in the morning. Amen. Oh, we welcome you, Jesus. We invite you, Holy Spirit. On every voice together, I know breakthrough's coming. And I know breakthrough is coming. By faith, I see a miracle. It's my God made me a promise and it won't stop now. Oh, I Right. The precious blood of Christ speaks to 
just release thanksgiving and gratitude in the room this morning, church. Well, right there where you're at, would you just begin to express your thankfulness to the Lord? I want to invite you just to remember and think about where would you be without Jesus? Where would you be without him? And then look where you are today because of what he's done. That his blood speaks a better word over us. Speaks life, freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We acknowledge you in this place. We fix our eyes on you today. It's singing now with life. It's shouting down the line. And it's making all things right. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. It's calling out. And it's calling out my name. 
and it's breaking every chain. Oh, and it echoes through the night. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word, speaks a better word. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's turn our eyes to you, Jesus. We fix our gaze on the throne. generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name it stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and possessions your name
you are worthy. You are worthy, God. We crown you this morning, Jesus. Just lift up your voice. Just sing a little bit of a song. You are worthy, Jesus. He wants your heart. Just sing it out, church. He wants your heart this morning. We lift you up this morning, Jesus. You are the only one who was worthy. You are worthy, God, the only one. We praise your name, Jesus. Let's just give it up one last time this morning. Thank you, worship team. Man, his presence is here. Ready to see miracles. We saw some miracles in first service. It was a beautiful service. I'm ex just expecting for this second service just... Stay in that, that posture of presence this morning. Amen. As you make your way to your seats, I just want to let you know uh, a few things. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors on staff. Kids Club, where are you guys at this morning? That is first through fifth grade. I want to remind everyone, Kids Club is, is first through fifth grade. So kids that are younger should already be in class if you're new to the church or you weren't aware, that's, that is how we do things. So first through fifth grade, if you haven't checked in your first through fifth grader, do that at Guest Connect now. Love you, Kids Club. Have a good time. If you are new, I'd love to just welcome you. Uh, there's a couple ways that you can connect with us. You can text that number, text the word connect and get connected with us. Or you can use the QR code on the seat back in front of you. Scan that, fill out that form. We would love to get to know you and get connected with you. We have uh, multiple ways to give. If you want to worship with your tithes and offerings, you can do that in the ways that are up on the screen there. Online, in person, on the app, and by mail. The big four, as I call them. We also have a ton of announcements going on every week, so get connected. The YouTube video, I do like local on the eights. That's what I do. We, we create that. Does anyone watch the Weather Channel? I think I'm the only one who does, and I'm like... I mean, I'm not ashamed at all. I'm a nerd. I just love weather. I'll be looking at snow stuff in South Dakota and like, wow, this is awesome. So anyway, I'm the only one, but that's cool. Uh, so the weekly YouTube video is kind of like our just musical presentation of events. Every week comes out, so check that out. Um, women, where are you at this morning? Yes, you're alive, you're awake. The women's fall table event is coming up. So Karis, the director of the women's ministry, is so excited about this. She said the last event was just killer, just amazing. So get registered. Registration opens today, September 12th. This is, you can see, Gather Fellowship Encounter. You're going to gather in homes. You're going to have meals together. It's authentic community. And guys, as we get bigger, I look out here, I don't know so many people, right? We're growing so much as a church. So ladies, this is an opportunity for you to really dive in with, with women, have real authentic fellowship, share your testimony, hear testimonies. It's a powerful time as we grow as a church to still maintain that community. Amen. So get registered, mh.church slash table. It's going to be an awesome time. And then we have one of the biggest events of the year, We're calling it Group Connect. Pastor Jordan was on me all week. You got to emphasize this, Josh. So I'm doing that. Sunday, August 27th, Group Connect uh, after first service, after second service. So either service, we're going to be in the gym. There will be donuts. Amen. So we got donuts going for us. <laughs> uh, what it is, is it's, it's what it is. It's Group Connect. So who's excited about groups coming up? I'm, I missed it. I'm, in the summer, we have, we have a lot going on, but I miss groups. Groups is the lifeblood of the church, what Pastor Jordan always says, and I agree. So get connected to a group. Some groups are studying books. Some groups are just recapping the sermon from the weekend, whatever. There's tons of different groups. So, you know, 
go in there, meet the group leaders on this Sunday. They'll be in the gym. We'll have a group's guide that's a printed uh, kind of booklet for the groups. Don't miss out. If the Lord's leading you to do something else, maybe. Okay? But otherwise, get into a group. Okay? Amen? Well, I have the uh, pleasure of introducing Pastor Jason. He's been out on sabbatical. Give it up for Pastor Jason this morning as he comes. Well, good morning, Messiah's house. If you would, take your Bible, find the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, turn to chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter 2. They say that absent makes the heart grow fonder. I've found that to be true, being out in July. I have missed being with you. I'm glad to be back here worshiping with you on this Sunday morning. I've missed my church family. I've missed worshiping together with you. And of course, I love to preach and teach the Word of God. So I'm ready to jump back in. Uh, we had an amazing July. We take July, in case you don't know this, every July, Leanna and I take, take that month off just kind of as a little uh, sabbatical, a mini sabbatical, if you will. It's a time for us to vacation, but it's also a time for us to just refresh, recreate, rest, we write, things of that nature. This past uh, July was really special, though, for us because our youngest daughter, Kennedy, uh, got married to Carson, my new son-in-law, and uh, so they had a destination wedding in Florida. It was incredible. It could not have been better, amazing. Then we had family vacation, and then Leanna and, Leanna and I got to do some traveling and some writing, and so we had just a full month, lots going on. We were excited about coming back. Our hearts are full. We've got vision for the, for the fall, and we were hearing God. But our, our trip uh, got ended abruptly, a couple of days early. Uh, some of you are aware of this, uh, but uh, a good friend of mine, a member of our church, his family uh, attends here. They serve here. They've been here over four years. A good friend of mine named Jess Little um, took his life uh, a week ago Friday, or this, yeah, a week ago Friday. And so we were supposed to come back on Sunday evening I got that call on Friday evening, so we rescheduled. We got home on Saturday, and then while y'all were having church here last Sunday morning, we were meeting with all of their family in Claude. That's where they live. Where the, that's where they've grown up. And so, as you can imagine, it's just been it's been kind of an emotional roller coaster for for us. Uh, Jess was a former pastor for thirty years. Uh, he and I became good friends. We met on a consistent basis. One of the biggest encouragers in my life uh, was Jess. And I talked to him the day before he took his life. I had no indication uh, that he was thinking that way. And so it was a shock to me, shock to their family. He leaves behind an amazing wife, three uh, beautiful daughters. And as you can imagine, they need our prayers. They need our love. They need our support. You may not know them. I know we're a pretty big church. We have two services. They usually come to this service. Um, their daughter, she's on uh, several of the impact teams. And so you probably have seen them, didn't know who they were. Um, none of them are, I don't believe, are here today. But uh, it, it's just been, it's been weird because I came back and started prepping for the funeral. The funeral, the graveside was on Wednesday. And it was Thursday before I realized I haven't had time to mourn yet, personally. You know, I've been so focused on getting ready for this funeral and saying what God wanted me to say. And so the last couple of days have kind of been like an emotional roller coaster for me. And I always come back from sabbatical. And people say it, that first Sunday I come back, we're excited. You know, I'm fired up. I got, you know, it's like trying to get a drink out of a fire hydrant. It's just, whoa, let's go. And this year's different. Um, you know, I just... It's weird to, to think, you know, about it like this, but it's a weird thing to have your heart full, but then to have your heart broke. I don't know if you've ever been in that kind of situation, and so it's, it's just emotional. I say that for two reasons. One, if I do tear up, uh, I find myself just tearing up when, at, the, at a moment when I'm not expecting it. Uh, that could be, be part of it. Uh, Jess always texted me on Sundays, and so this is the first Sunday that, you know, I won't have that text. And uh, I also just mention all of it because they're members of our church and uh, precious family. Pray for their family. Pray for their girls. Um, all right. With that in mind, we're going to jump into a brand new series this morning. I am both excited 
and a, a little bit nervous uh, about this new series. I can tell you already, this is going to be the toughest series of my ministry. It's going to be the hardest series from a writing standpoint that I've ever attempted because of the subject matter, because there's so much content and so much to think about with some of these things we're going to be looking at. Uh, it's going to be a lot. And not only that, but God has told me uh, to basically bring two messages every Sunday for the next seven weeks. So we're going to start this series. I know some, don't get too nervous. That doesn't mean we're going to be here twice as long. Uh, but we're going to start this series this morning, and I'm calling it Strange Stories. Strange Stories. The Bible is full of miraculous stories, no doubt. But if you read the Bible, you will find it is also full of some very, very weird stuff, some very strange stuff, some confusing stuff stuff, obscure things, things you read, it leaves you scratching your head and you're like, why is that even in the Bible kind of thing? There's a lot of that in scripture. For the next seven weeks, I'm going to attempt to go after some of these strange stories, hopefully to make some sense of them. And at the same time, hopefully we will learn the lessons of faith that God is trying to teach us through some of these events that take place, okay? Okay. Uh, and so what I'm going to do when I say I'm going to bring two messages, what I mean is I'm going to teach. I'm going to preach, if you will. It's probably going to be more teaching than preaching. I'm going to preach and explain the story, hopefully, and then I'm going to prophesy. So two messages. When I say prophesy, make sure you under, understand me. Uh, when people think uh, about prophesying, most people think of, of foretelling the future, predicting the future, like I'm giving a word concerning the future. In the Old Testament, when they prophesied, they were prophesying things that were to come. When you move into the New Testament, though, it shifts, and prophecy goes from foretelling to forth-telling. Prophecy, at its most basic definition, is really just supernatural utterance by the Holy Spirit. It's divine inspired in the moment to bring edification and exhortation to the body. And so we're going to look at these events, explain the events. Then I'm going to bring some kind of word each week that I feel like God is speaking in the moment for us as a church family and how these stories pertain to us in the season that we're in. All right, are you excited? All right, let's get into it. Second Kings chapter 2, we're going to start off with a doozy. Buckle up. We're going to be reading about a prophet named Elisha, verse 23. Elisha went up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him saying, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there, he went on to Mount Carmel. From there, he returned to Samaria. Look at your neighbor and say, this is strange. <laughs> Let's pray together. We need God's help. Uh, God, I am just grateful for your word this morning, and I believe every word that's in it. I believe every word that's in it is important for us. Uh, and so, God, when you put stories like the one we're looking at in this, this morning, when you put that in Scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we, we know by faith, God, that you are wanting to use that to speak to us. And so, Lord, I pray you'd help me. I, I pray you would speak through me this morning, God, that revelation, not just information, but there'd be revelation that would flow in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, a little context here, if you go back to the beginning of chapter 2, you can go back and read all of this, but it would just take too long for me to read all of that uh, in this service. But when you go back to ch uh, chapter 2 and read through it, what you find is that Elisha, uh, it, he succeeds the prophet Elijah. He's like his understudy. Elijah was his mentor, if you will, and he learned underneath him. And before Elijah is taken, he says to Elisha, what would you ask of me? And Elisha says, I want a double portion of your anointing. And Elijah says, hey, that's a, that's a hard thing to ask. If you see me when I'm taken, then you can have it. And as they're walking along, chariots of fire and horses of fire separate the two of them. Elijah is caught up in a whirlwind. 
And Elisha keeps his eye on him the whole time. And he sees him. And before Elijah goes to heaven, he drops his cloak. It falls. And then Elijah is translated to heaven. Elijah never died. Elisha goes over, picks up the cloak. The first thing he does, he goes to the Jordan River. When he gets to the Jordan River, he says, where is the God of Elijah? And he strikes the water and the water parts. And he goes across and he knows that the mantle is on him. He has the anointing. He has the calling of God now to replace Elijah. And then if you follow along from there, he goes to Jericho and he heals the waters that had been contaminated. People were dying. There were miscarriages because of the water and the pollution. And he says, bring me a brand new bowl, put salt in it. And then he goes to the spring of the water, pours the salt in, and the Bible says he heals the water. And to this day, it is still healed because of his actions. So that's the first miracle that he does. Then we come... And remember, this is how he's getting started in his ministry. We come to Bethel. And this is his first confrontation. This is the first time that resistance comes to him in his newly acquired ministry and calling, if you will. I want to ask you, how does this story make you feel? When you read it, when I, I want to ask some moms in the house. When you think about 42 small boys being mauled by two she-bears, I mean, what, what in the world? What rises up in your mind, right? I mean, does it shock you? It, does it confuse you? Does it make you question like, why, God, would you do that? It seems so cruel. Does it at least... Make you uncomfortable. I don't know if you've ever heard this story. Many people have never heard some of these stories we're going to be looking at. I've had tons of people say, I've never heard that story in my life. Some of you are familiar with it. This is something I promise you. I say I promise. I highly doubt anybody else is preaching this passage this morning in Amarillo, <laughs> Texas. <laughs> uh, it, it's tough. It's a t- these things are tough to preach on. Yeah. They just really are. And so... How does it make you feel? Here, here, feel. Here, here's the interesting thing. I was thinking about this story and as I was writing, and I thought, you know, I can't remember a Christian ever asking me about this story. The only people, and it's only been a handful of times, the only people that have ever asked me about this particular event are professing atheists or non-believers. Atheists love to take a passage of Scripture like this to come against God. And say, yeah, well, God is love. If God is love, as you say, then why would he kill 42 little kids? And when people ask questions about events like this, the good thing is it means they're studying their Bible. But it also makes me wonder why no Christians have asked me about this story. Makes me wonder if some atheists and non-believers are reading their Bibles more than many of the church people. No judgment here. So here we go. How do we interpret this story? There are two interpretations that I've heard over the years. The first time I ever heard this story, I'll never forget it. I was 20 years old. I was a youth pastor at First Baptist Church, Chillicothe, Texas. And I heard this story at Vacation Bible School of all places. (laughs) This is true. I I was in charge of recreation for vacation Bible school, and then I would just kind of float around and go to classrooms, and I went to the fourth and the fifth grade classroom, and there was a little old godly lady there in our church. She was a widow, and she loved God, and she was using this passage to teach the fourth and fifth graders. I had never heard of it. I was 20 years old. I hadn't even read the whole Bible yet. I I had never heard of this. I was intrigued, so I stayed. She was an artist, and she had painted a painting, and the artwork told the whole story. There stood a prophet with a rapidly receding hairline, (laughs) teeth gritted, his arm waving menacingly. Before him was a group of boys, just about old enough for t-ball, writhing on the blood-splattered ground as two she-bears gnawed at and tore their limbs from their bodies. 
And the moral of the story, this is what she said. The moral of the story was this. Pay honor to your elders and your church leaders, or you too might suffer a similar fate (laughs) from God who will not be mocked. That's an interpretation. (laughs) Another interpretation, and this interpretation requires you to go against the text. And and at the seminary I didn't graduate from, they, they taught me never to preach against the text. But this interpretation requires you to go against the text because it implies the scripture says something that it doesn't. But another interpretation is that Elisha was just a cranky old prophet. And he was having a bad day. And he just lost his temper when those kids made fun of his bald head. And he misused the authority that God given to him. And the moral of that story is to be careful with your words and don't lose your cool. A couple interpretations. I would like to suggest to you that neither of these two popular interpretations actually fit this, this text or this story. This misunderstood story is not a moralistic tale about bald prophets and child-eating bears designed to teach youth to honor their elders and preachers. Nor is this story about abusing your power and losing your temper. Listen, here's what I believe this story is about, and I'm going to show you this. It is a brief glimpse into the age-old war that began in a garden and ended in a tomb, an empty tomb. And you may be thinking, I don't know how you're going to get to that out of this text. Well, just hang on. I've been in ministry for over 30 years, and it seems that I've spent just as much of my time unlearning bad biblical interpretation as I've spent learning good biblical interpretation. When it comes to stories like this one, there are three indispensable tools that have been an aid to me, and I want to share those with you um, this morning. Number one, the first tool to help you understand stories like this is knowledge of the original language. Knowledge of the original language. In this case, it would be Hebrew. Number two, understanding where smaller stories fit within the larger biblical text. You have to understand, although the Bible is made up of many books, it is one story. And every story, even small stories like this, fit somewhere in the big picture of the gospel. And number three, and I'm going to butcher this, and I know it, and I'm okay with it. There's a phrase that rabbis use. We're putting it on the screen. Mahasa avat saman ivanam. I don't know if that's right or not. But I can tell you what it means. It means... The actions of the fathers are a sign for the sons. Let me say it again. The actions of the fathers are a sign for the sons. And this is a phrase that the rabbis use, and I'll explain that more in just a moment. What I want to do is use each one of these tools to retell the story in a way that hopefully gives us good interpretation And it also teaches us some lessons in faith and what God wants us to get from this story. Now listen, here's what you got to understand about what I'm attempting to do in this series. It requires me to give a lot of information. And it requires me to be a little more bound to my notes at times than I like to be. But there's so much context and stuff that goes into stories like this. So if you're going to understand it, you got to have that. And so I'm going to give you a lot of information. Some of you like that. Some of you find it boring. Just hold on because then hopefully that information gets us to revelation. All right? And that's how our lives are changed. So let's use these three tools to go back through this story. Number one, let's talk about the original language. When Elisha drew near to Bethel, it says a group of people mocked him. Many Bible versions say they were little children. Maybe if you have the King James Version, the King James Version says little children. The the NIV uses, I believe, just boys. I'm in the ESV uh, this morning, and my translation says small boys. But the Hebrew phrase here is a combination of a noun and an adjective. 
The noun is a word called na'ar, N-A-A-R, na'ar. The adjective is katan, Q-A-T-A-N, katan. What do these mean to us? Well, the word na'ar has a broad range of meaning in the Old Testament. It is used in several places. It can denote everyone from baby Moses to a fully grown Absalom. A na'ar can also designate a servant, an armor bearer, king's official, and significantly for us today, a priest. So this word that's used here in this passage about these people who mocked Elisha, it is a word that can mean servant or priest. Now the Hebrew adjective katan means small, little, or young. The question is how young? How old were these boys? The same Hebrew combination, Noar Katan, is used to describe Solomon when he took the throne at about the age of 20 years old. That's 1 Kings 3 7. It was also used to describe Joseph's brother, Benjamin, when he was in his 20s as well. It's also used to describe Isaac when he was 28 years old, almost 30 years old. You see these two words being used in the Hebrew in different places to describe different ages. What's my point? Well, at bare minimum, we can say it's highly unlikely the people who mocked Elisha were toddlers or that they were little children or kids. It's much more probable that these were young men, ages maybe 18 to 30 years old, and that they were called Na'ar, not in reference to their sex, being male, being boys, but their office as servants or priests. I'll come back to that in a moment. Tool number two, how does this small story fit within the big story? Well, if you want to understand Bible story, Pastor Gary, you got to pay careful attention to geography. Where does this event happen? It happens at a place called Bethel. You may remember Bethel means house of God. You may remember that Jacob is the one who named the place Bethel. He laid down one night, had a dream, Jacob's ladder, angels ascending and descending from heaven to earth. He wakes up. He says, wow, surely God was in this place. I wasn't aware of it. He names the place Bethel, house of God, sacred ground. But at this time in Elisha's day, Bethel had become one of the two main worship centers for the northern kingdom. And not just worship, but rebellious, covenant-breaking, idolatrous worship. King Jeroboam founded Dan in the north and Bethel in the south as his kingdom's two alternatives to Jerusalem. See, he didn't want his people to go to Jerusalem to worship because he was afraid he would lose their allegiance to him. So he comes up with a plan to... Make it convenient. Oh, don't we love convenient Christianity? Let's make it convenient and let's give them places to worship so they don't have to go back to Jerusalem. So he sets up two golden calves, at one at Dan, one at Bethel. He ordained non-Arionic priests. He changed the time of the festivals and Baal worship soon began to reign. Bethel was no longer a place for God to be worshipped. It was no longer sacred ground. It stood against everything that Moses had commanded. So there's a confrontation going on here that is way bigger than Elisha being mocked for being bald. When Elisha approaches the idolatrous city, the young men mocked him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. What are they doing in mocking him? Well, first of all, they're saying they don't believe him about Elijah. He's he's told everybody that Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind to heaven. And so they're basically mocking his story or his testimony. They're making fun of Elijah. They're making fun of him. They're calling him bald head because being bald was actually a sign of weakness in their culture. Strength was attached to hair. And so if he were bald, they were basically making fun of him saying, you're weak, you'll never be like Elijah. It's also possible that he had shaved his head. And the reason that he was bald is he'd shaved his head because he was in mourning for Elijah. So in that case, they're mocking him in his mourning, all right? 
So all of these things are possible. They're making fun of him. They're saying, go away, basically. Get out of here. Like Elijah, be gone. Fly away. In other words, we don't want you here. You're not welcome here. They're not just rejecting. They're rejecting the God of Elisha. They're rejecting the prophet. They're rejecting the word of God because they're being threatened because he comes against their gods. This small story is a part of a bigger story of the ongoing war between God and his worship, false gods and their worship. Elisha represented the one, these young men the other. In other words, it's a small battle in the ongoing war between light and darkness, God and gods. When the rabbis, tool number three, when the rabbis said the actions of the fathers are a sign for the sons, they meant this. What God did for and with the fathers of old, he would repeat in future generations. Now, I'm going to show you something really cool here. Hang on to this. I think this is really cool, but it may just be me. But but basically, what he's saying is, is what God did for with the fathers of old, he would repeat in the future generations. In this story, for example, Elisha's repeating the pattern that Joshua had set. How so? Okay. After the death of Moses, Joshua took over leadership of Israel. He left the wilderness, he miraculously crossed the Jordan, and he led Israel in a campaign to destroy the idolaters of Canaan. So, likewise, after the departure of Elijah, Elisha takes over the prophetic office. He leaves the wilderness. He repeats the miracle of crossing the Jordan on dry ground, and then he enters into the land to go to war with the idolaters at the city of Bethel. It's a pattern. There, there are patterns in Scripture. This is a pattern that you'll see over and over. Also, just as God used hornets to attack the idolaters of Canaan, he used two she-bears to attack the idolaters in his land. Elisha pronounced a curse, but listen, God's the one who sent the bears. Elisha cursed them. God sent the bears. So you have to ask the question, Why? Would God do that? Well, number one, he would do that because he's true to his word. He keeps his word. You say, what do you mean? It says Elisha cursed them, and it is a covenant curse. If you go back to Leviticus chapter 26, verse 21 and 22, God said this to Israel. He said, if you remain hostile to me and refuse to listen to my words, I'll send wild animals against you and they will rob you of your children. God had already told them this would happen if they refused to listen to him. So he keeps his word. He is not a man that he should lie. Why else would he send these bears? Notice they are (laughs) she-bears. I mentioned earlier that Noar is often a title for a servant or priest. Because this event happened at Bethel where a golden calf was, here's my interpretation of this text. This is my opinion, okay? I suspect these were 42 priestly servants attached to the city's idolatrous shrine, the golden calf. They worshiped Baal. They mocked and ridiculed Elisha. It was more like an angry mob or a gang that was attacking Elisha because he opposed their God. God sent she-bears as protection for Elisha from the angry crowd. Why she-bears? Because they're meaner than (laughs) he-bears. You, uh, uh, she bears, if you've ever been around a mama bear and her cubs, this is serious business. You don't want to mess with the cubs because a she bear will protect her cubs at all costs. I believe this is a picture of God protecting Elisha. He's protecting him, and God sent these bears not only for protection but as a message to all those who would oppose him. So as I said earlier, this weird story is actually a brief glimpse into the age-old war that began in a garden and ended at an empty tomb. Bears may play a significant role here, but the real animal in the overarching story is a serpent. His slithering and slandering tongue was inside the mouths of these mockers. 
The God whom they served, Baal, was just a mask for Satan. And their fate was a preview of the serpent's fate. Except it wouldn't be a bear that mauled the serpent. It would be a lamb, the lamb of God. This lamb's victory is for Elisha and for all of us who live in his resurrection kingdom that will have no end. By the way, why 42? We don't know if there were more than 42. It just says 42 of the young men were mauled. Well, did you know 42 is the number of the Antichrist? Revelation chapter 13, verse 4 and 5 says that the beast will dominate the earth for 42 months. I'm talking about the spirit of the Antichrist, Satan working behind these priests of Baal to come against the man of God, the prophet of God. God is protecting him and letting everybody know he serves the one true God. He's confirming him in his place as a prophet. I told you there are patterns in Scripture so, you know, just like the fathers of old uh, set the way for the sons, we saw that with Joshua and Moses. We see it with Elijah and Elisha. Did, uh, Elijah and Elisha. Did you see it with Jesus? Jesus followed the pattern. Jesus, like Joshua and Elisha, came out of the wilderness. He, was, he went to where first? The Jordan. Not to part it, but to be baptized in it. Then he began to do miracles. Then he confronted the religious idols of his day. But then, instead of bringing a curse, he died on a cross and became a curse for us so that we might become sons and daughters of God, so that we could receive the blessing of God. Aren't you glad you're in a new covenant? Aren't you glad God's not mad at you this morning because you sinned yesterday? Aren't you glad God's not waiting to zap you? Aren't you glad? We're in a covenant of grace because of Jesus. (laughs) Well, I hope that gives you a little more insight to this strange story. But what does it have to do with us today? I was praying about it, and I felt like the Lord talked to me about the two idols, the two calves, one at Dan, one in Bethel. I saw two, uh, two golden calves in the church building, and they had necklaces on. One necklace named one of the idols, the other necklace named the other idol. And, and the Lord said there are two religious, they're religious in nature, two religious idols that Messiah's house has got to be on guard against consistently. And if it's in the house this morning, it's something we have to put to death. We have to repent of and we have to turn away from. The biggest hindrance to revival is idolatry. It's idolatry. And so I want to tell you what these two idols are, but before I do, I want to show you the, the seriousness of what I'm talking about. What, what, what happens... When there's idolatry, what happens? Well, I want to show you. If you go back to Deuteronomy, we'll have these verses up on the screen. This is Deuteronomy chapter 32, beginning in verse 15. But Jeshurun, Jeshurun's another name for Israel. Okay, so this is talking about Israel. Interesting, Jeshurun comes from a root word that means upright or straight. Upright. It's just ironic in lieu of what this passage says because they were anything but upright, if you will. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked and grew fat, stout and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. And they stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently whom your fathers had never dreaded. You were unfaithful or unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw it, and he spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them, and I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faithfulness. We'll stop there. Notice two things that happened when they were engaged in idolatry. Number one, demons were coming and harvesting worship for Satan. Did you see that? 
That's verse 17. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known. Listen, the gods that they worshipped, these idols, had names. You would have never been able to convince them that they were worshiping Satan. But the Bible says when you're engaged in idolatry, demons are getting the worship. They come, that's what's behind every idol, is the demonic realm. The demonic realm comes and harvests worship for Satan when you and I are engaged in idolatry. The second thing happens is that you begin to lose the awareness of his presence. Notice he says, I will hide my face from them. See, idolatry is the biggest hindrance to revival because revival is a community being saturated by the presence of God. And when you're engaged in idolatry, God will begin to hide from us. And he doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. He pulls back to where we don't, where we, we don't sense him like we used to. We, we don't feel him like we used to. We don't hear him like we used to. So this is serious business. And I hope, I hope we can receive that this morning because this is very strong, what I'm saying to us right now, because there are two religious idols. Here's the thing about idolatry in North America, in the church today. Most of us don't think we're in any danger of idolatry. You know, when you think about an idol, you think about some half-naked savage in a jungle somewhere bowing down to a statue, right? That's idolatry. Well, that's a form of idolatry. There are different forms of idolatry. There are different kinds of of idols. How do we define idolatry? Let me give you a simple definition. Idolatry is giving what only God is worthy of to something or someone else. That's it. Giving what only God is worthy of to something or someone else. Listen, it doesn't matter what it is. Satan doesn't care what you worship as long as it's not God. He's constantly at work to try to get us to turn our hearts toward idolatry. And some of these things are so sneaky because they're good things. You wouldn't think of them as idols because we glorify them in the church sometimes. Golden calves, if you will. So I'm going to go after two religious idols here. The first one is something I've taught on a lot over the years. I won't spend much time here, but I do feel like it's a, a, like a warning for us as we're moving into this, this fall and as we continue to move into seasons and flows of revival and all that God wants to do. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. This is a huge one. The first idol is the fear of man. The fear of man. Notice John chapter 12 Verse 42, it says, Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in Jesus. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. Watch this. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Religious leaders, Jewish leaders, believed in Jesus, but wouldn't confess him because they cared more about what the Pharisees thought and being put out of the synagogue. They didn't want to lose position and status. And so they wouldn't confess Christ. That is called the fear of man. The fear of man is fueled by the power of opinions. If someone's opinion of you holds more power over you than God's, you have an idol. If you won't take a step of faith because you're worried about what others think or say, then you have an idol. If man's approval of you will keep you from doing something that God tells you to do, you have an idol. These Jewish leaders wanted man's approval more than they wanted God's approval. How does that relate to us today, church? Well, when you're moving in in what we're calling revival, God's at work in different ways and in a church our size, different services, as many people as we have, there are going to be a lot of different pockets of things going on in different areas. And God's going to begin to use you in a lot of ways. There are going to be times where God's going to tell you to do something. And that temptation to be afraid of what man thinks is going to face you. 
And, and I want to come against that now. You, you need to hear this. I, I prophesy this to you this morning. The fear of man wants to come and work in our church. The fear of man will keep you from doing what God tells you to do. God's going to be telling some of us to do some things, go to someone, give a word to somebody, do something we haven't done before, wave a flag even though we don't know what it means and we're scared to death. It's going to you're going to go get prayer and you've never come down to the front before. God's going to begin to move. He's going to tell you to witness to somebody. Whatever it is, some of you are going to have dreams and visions and God's going to want you to share them and you're going to have to be faced with this opinion and the power of opinions. Whose opinion will hold more power over you? God's or man? If we begin to fear man, if I hold back from saying stuff that God's telling me to say, we will grieve the Holy Spirit. Same is true with you. I did uh, Jess's, Jess Little's funeral on Wednesday, and man, God just told me to be bold. And he said, I want you to go in. Because it was in the gymnasium in Claude, and I think the whole town came. I mean, it was packed. Uh, they were really loved. But, uh, you know, I went in there, and, and God said, I want you to come against the man-made doctrine, the demonic, demonic doctrine that suicide is an unforgivable sin. I want you to be blunt about it. I want you to call out the denominations that believe this. I want you to attack it. So I went in, and I did that, <laughs> and I, I knew there was a resistance in the room. You could feel it when I started going down this road, and I said, I know some of you believe this. You've been taught this, but the Bible doesn't teach that. There's only one unforgivable sin, and it's not suicide. It's unbelief. It's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And now, I'm not justifying suicide. Please don't hear that because it is sin. And it's a grievous sin, and it does tons of damage, and it is a decision I hope none of you make. By the way, some of you may remember the last Sunday I was here, I had had a dream about three people committing suicide in our gym. And I came against the spirit of suicide the last Sunday I was up here. I had no idea that my friend was facing that. And it was like God was, I was already wrestling against this spirit, and I didn't even know it. And so at his funeral, I was like, I'm, gonna, I'm going after it. I'm mad at the devil, <laughs> you know. So I'm going to go after this. So I did. Afterwards, this guy came up to me. He was pretty hot. Uh, and he said, uh, I have grown up in the Catholic Church. We believe that if you commit suicide, you can't be saved. And I said, well, what do you base that on in, in Scripture? And he said, Judas. And I said, well, Judas did commit suicide, and Judas did go to hell, but he didn't go to hell because of his suicide. He went to hell because he never placed faith in Jesus Christ. That's the unforgivable sin, blaspheming or rejecting God when he comes upon you. So you can feel the resistance in the room right now. I'm coming against this suicide thing. There's something going on. The funeral home director told me, that, that this year, he said, we usually have eight to ten suicides a year. He said, we're already at 45 this year. The devil's at work. This, we're not playing games here. This is serious. And so if I'd have given in to the fear of man, you know, I would have grieved the spirit, I believe. Idol number two, and this may shock some of you, ministry. Ministry. It may be the sneakiest form of religious idolatry. Christian ministry is such a wonderful and essential pursuit that when idolatry creeps in, it can scarcely be recognized. You say, what do you mean ministry? Here's what I mean. If our greatest fulfillment and deepest joy come from serving Jesus rather than Jesus himself, we have an idol. The biggest obstacle to loving God is serving God. Can I say that again? The biggest obstacle to loving God is service for God. It's Mary and Martha. Mary sitting at the feet, Martha serving she gets upset. Jesus, why won't you tell my sister to help me? He says, because she's chosen what's better. Sitting at my feet. Intimacy with Jesus is better than serving. All our service is supposed to come out of sitting at the feet. What happens is we start serving, serving, and serving so much 
that we forget to sit at the feet. And all of a sudden, idolatry sneaks in because we're finding our fulfillment in ministering to people. And it looks good. And people will pat us on the back. But it really grieves the spirit. We're going to have to guard against it, church. We've got to guard against it. It's an idol in the church. Many people find their identity in stuff they do for God. So here's a few questions for you to ask yourself to help you identify if maybe ministry has gotten to a place in your life where it shouldn't be. Maybe it's an idol in your life. A few questions. Number one, are you content doing nothing? Or are you addicted to ministering? Number two, do you feel depressed when you aren't doing something for God? When I was traveling full time, I would go and do eight or nine weeks of youth camp in a row. I mean, it was just one high to the next, one high to the next, one high to the next. And every August toward the end of the month, when it was all done, and I'd go two or three weeks at home, camp season's over, I would struggle with depression. And I couldn't figure out why for the longest time. And, and God showed me, well, you've been on this high and seeing something happen every day and ministering to people and giving words and preaching, and now you're just at home. You find identity in what you've been doing. Number three, do you constantly talk about yourself, your ministry, or your calling? Can you listen as well as you talk? Number four, can you receive from and yield to someone whose stature or position you consider less than yours? Number five, can you have a normal conversation with people without being saturated with ministry jargon? And number six, are you constantly feeling burned out? Are you just tired? You're just exhausted. These two things, I'm telling you, are at work in the church. Not our specific church, although I'm sure they are at work, but in the church, capital C. These are things we got to be on guard against. These are things we got to watch. And I feel like God wants to release some people this morning. Man, we've come a long way from 42 boys getting mauled by bears. Um, <laughs> I told you it's two different messages every week. So that's this is what we're going to be doing. I feel like some people need to be set free from the fear of man in particular. God's been telling you to do something, nudging you to do something, but you've held back because you're worried about what they're going to think, what your boss is going to think, what your spouse is going to think, what your friend is going to think, whoever it is. And I want to see some people get set free Today, I didn't do this in the first service, um, but I just feel like this is, is, is the Lord. So I want us to stand together. If you, if you just want to acknowledge this morning that you've been living under a fear of man and the, the power of opinions has had a hold on you, and you want to be set free from it, let me tell you a way to be set free right now. Step out in faith. Right now, don't worry about what anybody else is thinking in the room. No, nobody. Just you and God. His opinion matters most. If you've been living under the fear of man, it, for some of you, all your life, you've struggled with this thing. Today is a day of freedom. It's a day to repent. I want to ask you to come to the front right now. If you've struggled with the fear of man, if that's a battle for you, and you want to be freed up today, you come. Thank you, God. Amen. Come on. <laughs> yes, thank you, God. Would you just begin to play? I just think the Holy Spirit wants to minister as people are still coming. See, this was a, a step of faith on your part, and I just want to say as, as a pastor, I'm just so encouraged by your response. And today, I want to declare you innocent in the name of Jesus, in the blood of Jesus. And today, I want to declare you free, completely Free. I want you to just receive it now, completely free from the opinions of others, from the fear of man. Just right there, right now, just tell him, God, I repent for, for worrying about what everybody else thinks, for allowing other people's opinions 
to sway me when I know you're telling me to do something. I just repent of that and I lay it down right now. And Father, as they do, I just pray all the shackles and chains, all the, uh, uh, God, even consequences that have come from some of that in their lives and their families and with kids and, and at work and, and, and coworkers and friends and even in the church. Oh, man, so much fear of man in the church. God, we just want to declare this place free. The atmosphere of this place will not be welcome to the fear of man. We will do what God says. We will believe God and we will act in faith. We will speak the words of God in boldness. We will live for God and we will not let other people sway what we do. Make a declaration in your own heart right now. I am free from the fear of man. I am free. So Father, we just agree for this freedom. We thank you for this freedom that's happening right now by your spirit. And I pray it be sealed up right now. And as people walk out of here today, God, my prayer for them is that they would know something has shifted in their life. They would feel that freedom. And, they, and as temptation comes today, tomorrow, whenever, because it'll come for them to be swayed again by fear of man, I pray, God, you'd remind them, Holy Spirit, remind them of what happened here today. Remind them they're free. It no longer has power over them. We just believe you for that right now, God, in Jesus' name. And the church said... Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Bless you guys. Thank you for your step this morning. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. We're going we're gonna to have teams that are up here willing to pray for people. If you need more prayer, you come. Our teams are going to kind of weed through the crowd, and they'll be up here. If you've never been born again, you should come today and surrender everything to Jesus. Everything. Give him your life today. Father, thank you for what you're doing in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.